Hi, it's Dr. Shona Halson here, and I'd like to invite you to join me on the uh, Physical Performance Show on the 24th of October, where we'll be talking all things recovery in uh, the three hour live stream event. So we're going to cover essentially four modules um, around recovery. We're going to talk about the fundamentals of recovery. We're going to talk about periodization and adaptation. We're going to bust some recovery myths. And of course, we're going to cover uh, the best recovery strategy we have, uh, which is sleep. So we're going to go through a range of different things, talking about how we can help you pick your best recovery strategy, but also talk about some of the different aspects where there might not be a whole lot of science to really help you look at how you can use recovery to really enhance your performance. Hi, I'm Ollie Williamson, Senior Physiotherapist at the English Institute of Sport, um, navigating triathlon injuries, and you're listening to the Physical Performance Show. I've had my ups and my downs. Absolutely breakthrough experience. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, the show designed to inspire the pursuit of your physical best performance. I'm your host, Brad Beer. Listen in as we delve into how the world's top physical performers achieve their success, as well as the highs, the lows, and the journey of getting there. Let's get ready, set, Let's go. Welcome to the Physical Performance Show, brought to you by Pogo Physio and our upcoming live stream event with Associate Professor Shona Halson, who you just heard from, Recovery Essentials for Optimal Performance, coming up on the 24th of October. I'm Brad Beer, sports physiotherapist and exercise scientist by trade and training and founder of Pogo Physio. Each week, we'll bring you the latest and greatest information and inspiration designed to help you perform at your physical best. And of course, we do this across a range of different episodes, interest editions, coaches' corners, featured performers, and expert editions. And I'm super excited to share with you this week's expert edition with physiotherapy colleague Ollie Williamson, Senior Physiotherapist for British Triathlon and the English Institute of Sport. As Ollie shares around all things navigating triathlon and endurance sports injuries. And we know that listeners of the Physical Performance Show are, by and large, endurance type athletes, coaches, and practitioners. So whether you are a coach, practitioner, or athlete, there is something in this episode, episode 239, and part two of my conversation with Ollie Williamson coming up next week, episode 240, for you. You're going to need a pen and paper. By way of bio, Ollie Williamson is based out of the Brownlee Triathlon Centre from within Leeds University. He also consults privately from within the Manchester Institute of High Performance. And Ollie's work with British Triathlon has coincided with working with literally the planet's best triathletes. These athletes include dual Olympic champion Alistair Brownlee, silver and bronze Olympic medalist Johnny Brownlee, former featured guest of the show, the current 2020 world champion Georgia Taylor Brown, and also former world champion Vicky Holland, also Olympic bronze medalist. And during this expert edition, part one of navigating triathlon and endurance sports injuries, Ollie shares around the key overarching goal for any endurance athlete in order to achieve their physical best and how health professionals can assist in achieving that overall objective. And Ollie shares some fantastic insights around common swim, bike and run injuries. Injuries discussed include the so often pesky proximal hamstring tendon troubles that so many runners and triathletes slash cyclists may experience and gold nuggets with how to approach this injury, kneecap pain for both cyclists and runners, swimming related injuries and of course the oh so common running injury involving bone stress. And then in part two of this expert edition, Ollie shares his practical takeaways around navigating common lower limb tendon conditions, recurring calf strains, key principles in return to running programs, and avoiding common mistakes. That'll be in part two. But for now, here is my conversation with Ollie Williamson, Senior Physiotherapist for British Triathlon on navigating triathlon and endurance sports injuries. (laughs) 
Ollie Williamson, we have been working on uh, lining this one up for some time, but it's a real pleasure and professional thrill to welcome you to the Physical Performance Show. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me. Ollie, we first connected several years ago across uh, the work of uh, physiotherapy in, in the, the field of triathlon. And uh, your role, as per your bio, you've been entrenched in the uh, British triathlon Olympic uh, team for quite some time, working there with the English Institute of Sport out of the, the Brownlee Triathlon Centre. So to put the listener of the show in context with your career to date and also a typical day in the life of physiotherapist, Ollie Williamson, can you paint a little bit of a, a bit of a picture? Yeah, sure. Well, as you say, yeah, my, my current role is um, I'm a senior physio in the in the EIS and seconded to, to British Triathlon. So I've been I've been working with British Triathlon now for probably a good set about eight years. So that that started, yeah, yeah, gosh, long time ago now, long time ago. Um, my, my 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 role, I suppose, is, is very much catered around the the athletes that are, that are catered the um, training out of the Leeds Performance Center. So we have a couple of performance centers um, around around the country. So we have one in one in Stirling, Scotland, one in Leeds in Yorkshire, one in Loughborough, um, and then one over in over in Bath. And, and my role is is to predominantly look after the Leeds based athletes. So we have about 14 athletes over there currently. Um, we have about four or five in, in Loughborough. We have we have one um, program athlete in Bath who's supported by a couple of training partners. Um, and then, uh, yeah, a couple up in in, in, in Sterling. So, um, day to day, my my role is is pretty much um, obviously taking care of any acute injuries that, that come that come through the door. Um, also, with looking at some proactive sort of um, interventions uh, to help athletes keep training. That's essentially our role uh, to in, to make sure we we keep training availability as as high as possible. Um, we are tr- we truly believe that athletes get better through through their ability to train and, and train fully. So if, if an athlete is, is is out of training because of injury or or, or, or not training fully as a result of uh, small things that maybe get in the way, so that they they're not fully training, then then that's where we think things can can go wrong, where spikes in training load can happen. So in terms of our role within British Triathlon, it's also working with 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 the coaches to make sure that um, training load is is well managed throughout the year, um, making sure that any sort of historical um, injuries are thought through um, from from the start of the season all the way through to the end. And if someone has um, a high prevalence of a certain injury, then we know the risk factors potentially involved with that, and then we try and mitigate those risks through 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 the year. Um, whether that's through S and C, whether that's through um, training load, and to be honest, it's, it's a combination of, of a lot of things. It's very multifactorial, as you know, an, an injury that comes along in in, um, in triathlon. So whether that's a nutritional deficiency, whether that's a strength deficit, whether that's um, acute changes in normal range of movement, let's say, um, around upper limb, lower limb, or, or, or the spine, um, that can potentially be a risk in itself. So, yeah, we, we very much work as an MD team in British Triathlon, um, make sure an athlete is very much centred um, within within any plan. Um, so everyone has an influence and has accountability, let's say, of, of, of adding their input into an athlete's plan. Um, so, yeah, the coach and the athlete very much in the centre fold of that, of that discussion, and then services around the athlete and I'm just one of those services so physio being one of the services around around the athlete SNC nutrition physiology um, and we, we tap into a couple of external practitioners for, for, for some other bits such as biomechanics um, and we, we work with um, a bike consultant as well um, so that's Phil Burt uh, who I know you're going to be catching up with at some point, um, so that'll be an interesting discussion with him. But yeah, he he, he works with sort of as an external practitioner to help with the bike setup and any sort of um, help around the bike that, that we may want further in, insight or input with. So yeah, um, in terms of my daily daily, um, I suppose agenda, we'll see probably three or four athletes probably in the day, um, and those athletes will be coming in for um, their weekly regular sort of monitoring once once a week, and then catch up with them. Of course, if any if any acute stuff kind of comes along the way that they want checking in on. And we have a database of um, objective measures. So we have range of movement strength um, and then movement qualities that, that, we, that we keep a check of. Um, and we use a live um, Excel spreadsheet, which 
um, tells us if an athlete is is moving outside of their of their norm. So we use Z scores and, and use normative data, and, and their and their um, their scores obviously would fluctuate potentially outside of one to two standard deviations. We might then start driving conversations with with coach and potentially putting some interventions in place to try and bring that score back to normal. For example, if a range of movement suddenly went you know, really far off, uh, whether it's ankle dorsiflexion range, hip external rotation, whatever, um, or, or a strength measure that kind of came came and was well outside of their norm, um, that's when we would input. Um, so not only, I suppose, in my, is my role day-to-day up in the, in the Brownlee Triathlon Centre, uh, my role is very much um, in-season travelling with the, with, the, with the guys as well in their World Series um, events or, or events that would accumulate Olympic qualification points. So we support a number of um, uh, events throughout the year. Um, obviously, this year coming up is a big one. Um, last should have been last year, but of course, with everything going on, we've had to shift things on another year. Um, so, yeah, World Series um, events are really fun. Um, bit of pressure, I suppose, from a perspective of, you know, um, uh, making sure that everyone gets to the World Series events in, in, a, in a good place um, as possible. So they're standing on that start line best prepared as possible. Um, and, you know, we've, we're very lucky to have a really strong uh, group of athletes that have been really successful over the years. And I'm just being extremely privileged to, to work with um, the British triathletes uh, over the years and witness some incredible races, some incredible results. Um, also had his challenges on a couple of them. Um, where we've kind of really had to um, help athletes decide very last minute whether they they can race. That's that's a very rare occurrence. Um, Athletes don't normally come up injured. Um, Normally it's just supporting them as best we can, Um, who are normally fit and well going to a race, but we've had one or two that picked up injuries, you know, um, and still wanted to race and see how they go. So there's been some challenging um, discussions in the past around that. But, yeah, all good learning and and good fun. But, yeah, um, triathletes are just really great people to work with, um, uh, very curious people normally. Um, norm- normally, you know, um, want asking a lot of challenging questions, which is great. Um, I've worked in, in a lot of other sports. I've worked in, in rugby and I've worked in um, uh, an environment which was looking after multi-sport. And, you know, and I'd say probably out of all the athletes, all, all, the, all the groups I've worked with as a whole, um, Triathletes are probably the most curious and probably the most challenging in terms of asking questions: why, why not, um, when can this happen? Uh, I don't know which sport has that has that element of um, time scales that always get discussed. But yeah, they're, they're a great bunch to work with. Very lucky, and, and I work with such a um, a great team. So um, the other practitioners within within British Triathlon within the IS um, are all fantastic people, very experienced, and I've I've learned a hell of a lot just by working with that um, MDT, with that, with that multidisciplinary team and um, picking up knowledge from them and um, coming up with some really sort of um, innovative ways to, to treat and be proactive with, with injuries and triathlon. So lots of moving parts and I, I think triathletes or people familiar with triathlon will, will, will know the world chronicled British triathlon success stories across the London Olympic Games through to Rio Olympic Games success. Uh, and world champions uh, along the way, uh, several who have featured as featured performers on the show in the past, Johnny Brownlee, who I know you work with, and uh, and also Vicky Holland. And uh, so I think it's it's worth noting that the success that you've had there is uh, no uh, no surprise, and it's no not by accident. It, it's a it's a very integrated. Uh, Team, you mentioned some of the external practitioners uh, and advisors like Chris Bremer, who you kindly introduced myself to uh, for an expert edition, expert uh, episode two two three, biomechanics of the running athlete, and then as you mentioned, upcoming guest Phil Burt around all things bike fits. So it's it's an impressive team. One thing jumped out there, Ollie, and that was a phrase you just used, and that's athletes get better through the ability to train, and it's almost amusing because it seems so obvious but uh, translating your professional learnings to the everyday athlete can you just expand on that a little bit more why that's it's so important I know you touched on it but to try and keep athletes training in full in this case we're talking about multi-sport swim bike yeah. run we we sat down with the coaches a long time ago around sort of what they felt was the kind of 
real factors that would um, help with success for an athlete. What, what, what does success look like? And therefore, working backwards from that, how, how do athletes get there? And the big thing that stuck out was just their consistency and, and availability to train. So um, what we're talking about there, if you drill into a little bit more, um, I suppose, is and, and a lot of literature is coming out now supporting this theory is we want to be able to maintain chronic training loads. So athletes are hitting um, volumes, intensities that the coaches are wanting them to do. Um, of course, there is discussions around that through the, the rest of the team. Um, our physiologists um, will have a big input into that as well. So getting sort of consultation from external practitioners to, to help with managing that. But we know that, and this is kind of work um, that's, that's out there, this is nothing new that I'm saying here, um, in terms of we want to avoid spikes, all right? So keeping, keeping athletes training at a consistent level, and we know that just from the literature that injuries come, when that consistency drops, and let's say a consistent training load has been happening, and then a sudden drop, five, six weeks off, potentially with something like a bone stress injury, um, if caught early enough, and then um, getting back up there is where you see the troubles come. So that's five, six weeks off training. That's, that's a lot of adaptations that haven't occurred during that period, and time is moving on. Season gets closer, races get closer. Athletes start to potentially overreach slightly to potentially try and get back on track, and that's where we start seeing um, other niggles that may be associated from the first initial offload. So from our perspective, our whole philosophy, and this is from the performance and the medical team, is just to make sure that training consistency is there, chronic training loads are maintained, um, and that we don't end up spiking through the year because we know that spiking through the year equals injuries, equals less consistency, equals less adaptations occurring from a physiological perspective, but also from a, a local tissue perspective. Um, so the demands potentially are increased elsewhere, um, and therefore that's that's a poor place to be for an athlete because there's time loss, lack of performance, overreaching, changing behaviours, um, etc. More energy expenditure potentially when it shouldn't be there. And what I mean by it, just just the listeners, energy expenditure is a simple energy balance, and we'll touch upon this a little bit when we potentially talk about injuries in triathlon and bone stress injuries are a big one um, from a nutritional perspective. Making sure that the energy balance is is maintained and positive. Um, for lots of different reasons, but mainly around from a bone health perspective, that's that's really important to maintain um, uh, bone strength, let's say. Um, so yeah, it has a cascade of effects that we don't want to go down. So yeah, um, keeping chronic training loads high is high on our agenda, and it's a big team that, that attempts. Of course, injuries are going to come. You know, it's part and parcel of the sport. Um, you know, these guys are training thirty hours a week. You know, something going to happen at some point potentially. But our job is to make, make sure that. All the information is there to make good decisions around training and keep that, that chronic training load as, as, as good as it can be. And you would have observed athletes who have gotten off that boom-bust cycle of injury, deload, injury, and then been able to establish consistent back-to-back -back training years. And you must have seen some pretty you know, remarkable turnarounds, I imagine, in your role over the last eight years. Yeah, we've had some very time critical, um, I suppose, cases that I can bring to the table. But yeah, you know, in terms of injuries have happened um, at probably the worst point possible in terms of we've got five, six weeks or, or potentially a, bit, a little, little bit longer, so make it a bit more sort of um, uh, realistic. Um, you know, you're looking at potentially two, three months out of a major, major games or a major event and a bone stress injury is potentially hit and we've got to try and do our best to get the athlete prepared for that. And of course, there are going to be decisions that are going to have to be made to, to, to get someone on the start line um, an accelerative, in an accelerative way. Um, but in the same breath, you know, as long as athletes are informed with, with the information coming from the team to make good decisions about that, then, 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 then we're happy. Our job is to not to say to an athlete, you can or you can't race. Our job is to inform the athlete and the coach to make sure that they have all the information at their disposal to make a good decision about the race and about whether they do race or whether their strategy for the race has got to change. Yeah, brilliant. I think of prior featured performer of the show, Ollie. He's not a British athlete, but French current world champion, Vincent Lewis. And, you know, he shared around his history of bone stress injuries. And then when he pulled his running volume right back down, 
he's had a great run for the last few years and he's had some terrific results uh, evidently. So it's a, it's a good example, as you say, of this consistency being there plus the availability to train. Yeah. Oli, swim, bike, run, we're talking multi-sport, navigating triathlon injuries. What are some of the common things that you, and we might go by each discipline here, that you'll attend to with regards to swimming? To be honest with you, Brad, like I'd, uh, I'd, our swimming volumes are nowhere near as maybe like a swim team would be, or or, or, or let's compare ourselves with um, British swimming, for example, uh, back back in the UK. I mean, our, our volumes and our tr- loads in the in the pool are way lower than than, than them. So um, we don't really see, if I'm honest with you, a great deal of time loss from injuries from swimming. We do get niggles, we do get um, shoulder issues, potentially supraspinatus tendinopathies. Uh, your classic sort of umbrella term of rotator cuff pathology. Um, and uh, we've had one acute bike fall where we've had a, um, um, a supraspinatus tear, which was surgically repaired. Um, that's probably the only time I can think we've had a huge time loss from from swimming. Um, but like I say, we keep, we keep track of markers so external and internal rotation of the shoulder thoracic rotation streamlined position so we call that combined um, elevation test um, streamlined essentially and if anything changes in that department from from a from a movement outside of a norm two standard deviations normally then then we'll probably input into the coaches and and, the, and obviously inform the athlete that there might need to be some short-term mitigation work around what they do in the pool whether that's drop in volume, whether that's intensity. Um, they'll classically do around sort of 4Ks worth of volume uh, in the pool uh, for five days a week. So it's not massive training, not, not massive volumes. Um, so, yeah, we, I mean, we'll move on as we go through the disciplines. I, mean, I suppose from a physio perspective, it gets a bit more interesting in terms of bike and run. Um, but swimming is obviously a great tool when someone is injured as well, so we can work on a lot of those of the performance uh, bits that, athletes may want to work on if, if they do get injured but uh, and there could be a performance um, need as well let's say an athlete has identified in their coach that swimming is a massive performance um, uh, deficit potentially to, to be to be successful then they may do more swimming um, and of course with that we can help inform if things are starting to show signs of homeostasis not being quite in line um, and normally by a reduction in training a reduction in, in volume in range of movement sorry the shoulder that's indicative of potentially um, tissues becoming hypertonic, uh, short, and potentially weaker, which could lead on to overload in the shoulder joint itself and the tendons surrounding. So, yeah, like I said, we're, we're using data a lot to kind of help inform around these discussions. But, yeah, I think we can move on quite quickly from swimming from an injury perspective because there's not really a lot of things we see from, a, from, from that perspective in terms of time loss. It's more management and maintenance to, to, keep, to keep them going, really. Um, yeah, do you want me to move on to bike? Yeah, and I was just going to add on. I mean, obviously, an interesting year with, particularly in the UK, their pool's been inaccessible largely. So uh, yeah. in terms of keeping the athlete training, there's been certainly some uh, challenges, not just in Britain, of course, but yeah. worldwide. Yeah, to that, that's, that's a good point you raised, Brad. I forgot about that. Although it's very, it's just it's still very, very yeah. <laughs> yeah. We all want to forget still, about still that. The short term, <laughs> yeah. I, haven't, I haven't shelved it just yet. Um, uh, but yeah, obviously with, with COVID, you're, you are right. We had a, a, an issue with pool accessibility and we just had to work with the coaches and athletes again, getting back into the pool gradually and, um, you know, making sure the shoulder conditioning was, was maintained where we could on land and you, it's very difficult to make that transition from on land into the pool if I'm honest with you I don't think there is a huge translation apart from just making sure physical qualities are there to maintain swim uh, mechanics so that would be push pull and just making uh, strength and conditioning and, and making sure that range of movement is, is maintained because that can easily go off if you're just stuck on a bike and running yeah. uh, without really pressing it and, and just to pick up a point that may otherwise be lost you know you mentioned you know measuring monitoring range of motion strength measures yeah and you know this is the elite level of the sport but some of these uh principles or practices i should say do apply to uh recreationally competitive athletes uh definitely where keeping an eye on measures through a year uh can help preempt potential injuries and uh yeah. via interventions you know, keep them keep them training Oh yeah, they're not, they're, not, they're, not, they're not fancy things either. You know, most of most of the measures we take rotationally are from just phones. You can get um, 
there's a there's an inbuilt measuring um, app which we can use almost like a spirit level, and we we may, we're able to look at angles as long as the consistency is there and the the reliability is there by doing the same things consistently. Anyone could do that. That's not just for elite um, athletes and a, and a physio to do. You know, a, a partner, a, a housemate, whatever could could take those scores for the you know athlete, recreational athlete, of course. Yeah. I wouldn't sort of pin everything on those on those measures, of course, but um, they just help inform a little bit if things are changing. But yeah, they're not they're not they're not difficult, complex tests that, that, that we do. It's the reliability that's important. Reliability. Let's go to the bike cycling. A bit more can happen here. Uh, what are the common cycling related injuries that you, you encounter in the work of uh, triathlon? Um, I think the first one to talk about in terms of the. The, the biggest injury that we see we have to manage is probably just a just general anterior knee pain. Um, we can probably classify that as patellofemoral joint pain. Um, so just for everyone, I suppose, listening in, what, what we mean by that is where the patella articulates it over the, the femur. It's got two little grooves, and um, the the compression at that point can, can increase quite a lot on a bike. Um, and with certain... Um, I suppose risk factors that are at play, you can be a little bit more susceptible to anterior knee pain on a bike and, and, and patellofemoral joint pain. And it'd be interesting when you get Phil on to probably dive into this a little bit further, but we, we've learned a lot just around the bike fit and the, and the setup can have a considerable um, contribution to anterior knee pain, patellofemoral joint loads, patellofemoral joint compression. Um, just to bring COVID back into the into the conversation, we we when we went into lockdown into the UK, um, a lot of um, the athletes uh, went to go and do a bit more indoor biking versus outdoor. So at one point, you could only do one in, in the UK. There's only early in our lockdown, you could only choose one activity to, to do outside, and most people ran. Um, and then biked indoors. Um, um, and with the advancement of Zwift and a few of the kind of real cool, innovative ways uh, to be competitive, if, if you like, um, indoors, uh, it, it went off massively. So our, our, our athletes suddenly started doing a lot more um, volume, intensity in, indoors on, uh, on, on, their, on, their, on their turbos or kickers or whatever. Um, and we, we started to see a bit more one by one patellofemoral joint pain that, that this person I think never really suffered from. Um, we were asking the question, okay, well, well why? In Zwift, obviously, it's great, fully endorsed using it, but there are risks involved. And what I mean by that is it's a fixed bike. You're in a fixed position. Normally, on a, on a, on a road bike, of course, you've got lateral movements. You've got um, loads being dissipated and shifted into the hip um, or in the ankle a little bit more, potentially. And with Zwift, you're just stationary. You're, or, or on a turbo, you're just, you're just stationary. Um, so, so with that, you, you're loading a very focal point over and over in what we call the sagittal plane. So, because you're seated and you're staying normally in your seat a lot longer, and you, you're you're banging in the watts because it's competitive, you, you're you know you you're forcing out a decent power. Um, so this is this is grinding sort of into the patellofemoral joint. Um, and some things that you can do to mitigate that are. Through, through bike fit or through saddle position and the saddle to, to, to pedal sort of angles. Um, and as the rules go, I suppose you've got, an, I learned this through a case that we might talk about later on, but with, if you have a saddle drop, you decrease, you increase in the knee flexion angle. Yeah. So when you de- when you're increasing the, sorry, increasing the knee flexion angle, the hamstring involvement reduces and you take on more load into the, into the quadriceps and the quadriceps, Go into the patella, and they and they um, as they contract, they 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 play a large role in, and that that patella has a great um, mechanical efficiency um, role to play with with any knee extension flexion. So it's it it has a direct um, attachment, and as the demands increase in the quad, the compression therefore happens at the patella, and it's, it almost squashes harder against the articular surface that it's that it's rubbing against. ITB then starts to get loaded up a little bit more, so you get more lateral load on the, on the thigh, um, and um, from that point on, it's, it's difficult to, to which you do get anterior knee pain. Very difficult to get out of it, if I'm honest with you. So bike position in terms of that knee angle is very important. You're going to increase risk if you are a little bit lower and a little bit further back. Yeah. So um, 
that will close off your hip, increase the angle at your knee, increase the patellofemoral joint, compressive loads. Um, but yeah, so seated, staying seated, putting the power on, good fun, great fun as it is, um, did start to show us some, some, some issues. So yeah, um, that was an interesting time for us because we had to suddenly start thinking about, okay, well, maybe we need to just get a bit more information out to the athletes and the coaches around around this and being careful with the loading and the management of the train load upon upon that sort of intervention. Um, so, so again, it wasn't to tell the athletes not to do it, it was just to inform them of these are the changes from, an, from out, outdoor bike to indoor bike. Know these, be mindful of them and manage that training load appropriately from a perspective obviously not there every single day just smashing it out. Some people got away with it and some people didn't. Mm. Um, but those who didn't get away with it, it was a decent time loss, if I'm honest, and a time loss we didn't expect. Um, so, yeah, we had to put some management around that once once it did become sore. And, and, and I know you've experienced, Brad, some anterior knee pain in your, in your time. And the art difficult, it's difficult to shift once that pain is there. Um, so, yeah, it's, it, was, it was a bit of a challenge, that one, to be fair, and one that kind of blindsided us a little bit. Not something you'd necessarily think about, the difference in... Uh, a fixed versus uh, outdoor bike in terms of, I guess, the mechanics. But once you do stop and think about it, it seems quite obvious that there would be potential difference and particularly in the mechanics at the knee joint. Uh, I, I wrote down and I certainly resonate with once you do get patellofemoral or anterior kneecap pain, it can be hard to get out of. Uh, I've, I've certainly experienced it to be cyclical and any uh, perturbation in my training loads seems to be quite a, a trigger at times. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's definitely not an, not an easy injury to necessarily uh, work the way out from. No, no, I suppose the injury that we have had um, come and go is mainly just the proximal hamstring tendinopathy. So where the hamstring inserts onto the issue tube rosti onto your sitting bone, we have had a decent, I suppose, amount of that over the years to manage. Uh, we've had one that's actually been surgically fixed back on. Um, that was a couple of years ago, 2017-18, when, when, when that was done for that particular athlete. So, yeah, we, it, 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 it's prevalent. Um, whether that's a compressive position over time or that's the topography that potentially the athletes are riding on in, in Yorkshire, very hilly, um, so whether, whether there's more load going on just from getting in and out of the saddle, putting the power on, uh, doing hill climbs, staying seated. Um, not too sure in terms of the, the reason um, necessarily, but in terms of things that we can do to help, of course, managing that load of, of when the hamstring will probably be taking on more load um, on the bike. Um, and also then just from a physio perspective, making sure the measures are maintained from a range of perspective, from a hamstring strength perspective, the adductor and the, and the role of the adductors are really important um, when we're talking about hamstring injuries. Um, I've learned a lot through from a, from a guy called James Moore. Um, I don't know if you come across James, um, but he, he's, he's taught me a lot in terms of hamstring injuries and um, the relationship of, of, uh, of different muscle groups upon, upon the hamstring. And the adductor magnus is, a, is essentially another hamstring. Um, it's involved with that extension moment at, at the hip and it's a massive stabilizer inflection. So when obviously our guys are sat on a bike or inflection, they have to extend from that flex position. The adductor group kind of gets forgotten about. Um, I know we've talked about this, Brad, and I'm, and I'm, I'm talking to, 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 to the preacher a little bit around it, but the, the adductor magnus plays a huge role. And from a perspective of hypersonicity, so taking the tone out of the adductors is the first thing. Um, second thing is, is, is it strong enough? So because of the hypertonicity, there's probably an underlying strength deficit or a conditioning deficit. So one of the things I would probably say to any recreational um, cyclist or athlete, make, don't underestimate, I suppose, the, the strength and the demand upon the adductor group in particular. Um, yes, everything's got to be, of course, you know, strong conditioned and able to tolerate what you're trying to put through it from a from a from a demand perspective. Um, but it's a, it's a group that generally gets missed. And I, I, will, I also work in the private. I used to work in the private world a bit more. I, I just run a very small evening clinic now privately. And whenever I've seen any recreational athletes kind of come through um, from a proximal hamstring um, injury perspective. If I'm honest with you, the vast majority have got deficits mainly in that medial um, thigh region, adductor magnus, adductor longus. Um, therefore, the hamstrings are just doing more than they should, if that makes sense. Um, so that sharing of that load is probably a little bit off. 
if the adductors aren't really thought through and haven't been conditioned appropriately. And Ollie, on that, there's bound to be people listening in with either current uh, episode of uh, proximal hamstring tendinopathy or prior one, or they know someone that is dealing with it. It's so prevalent. How might you instruct someone to assess outside of a clinic with a therapist their adductor mm. conditioning? Uh, is there any go-to test you might instruct people to take on at home? Yeah, for sure. There's there's there's, there's a there's a max max test you can do, which is just if if a, if a therapist is there, um, a, a squeeze test, then you can use dynamometry to help get some numbers there. If you don't have dynamometry, not a problem. You can use the Oxford scale, which the therapist should know, which is a score from zero to five, five being full strength resistance, zero being absent um they can give you a good idea where you are from a force production perspective so that's you lying on on your back legs straight the therapist would have um hands on either ankle on the inside you you produce force squeeze into the into the hands they'll either do a break test or a make test which is producing force into a dynamometer which will tell you a number um to give you an idea of how your adductors are functioning from a, we call that F-max test. The other test you want to probably have a look at is your uh, adductor bridge conditioning, so, uh, or time, so that's an endurance test, if you like, so you're lying, you could do this on a sofa, get into almost like a side plank position, top leg on top of a, of a sofa, lift the other leg off the floor, you're maintaining that nice position through ankle, knee, and hip, and trunk, and you're maintaining that position, and um, scores above sort of two minutes we would, we would cut off, um, but you, you're ideally looking to benchmark yourself uh, up to a minute at least, essentially. As a sort of, I'd say 30 seconds is a bronze level, 60, 60 seconds is probably a silver level. You're listening to part one of this expert edition with Ollie Williamson, Senior Physiotherapist for British Triathlon around all things navigating triathlon and endurance sports injuries. Support for today's show comes from our upcoming live stream event featuring former very popular guest of the show, Associate Professor Shona Halson. Shona Halson has been touted as the leading expert when it comes to all things athlete recovery. And on the 24th of October, just over a week and a half away, Shona will present a three-hour live stream, Recovery Essentials for Optimal Performance, where you will learn the practical hows, scientific whys, and enjoy some serious recovery science myth-busting. Tickets are available for just $49, including copies of all the presentation notes and a post-live stream recording. To secure your place for what will be a fantastic learning opportunity, be sure to jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash Shona Halson live stream. And as Shona says, remember the only training we benefit from is the training that we are recovering from. So learn how to recover with science and skill. Support for today's show also comes from Pogo Physio's online consultations. If you are an endurance athlete working through bone, joint, or a tendon-based injury, our popular telehealth consultations can be a fantastic way to resolve the injury. Jump over to pogophysio.com.au forward slash telehealth to find out more. For now, let's jump back with this week's featured guest, Senior Physiotherapist for British Triathlon, Ollie Williamson, on part one, Navigating Triathlon and Endurance Sports Injuries. Ollie, we're talking about bike injuries. We've touched on anterior knee pain, uh, hamstring, proximal hamstring tendinopathy. With the proximal hamstring tendinopathy, any any learnings you've taken over your career to date around athletes, in this case triathletes, could apply to cyclists, of course, as well, but going from a, tr- a TT bike to a road bike and, and the effect of uh, set up there with regards to proximal hamstring tendinopathy, I've just clinically observed over the years often uh, – a bit of a spike in uh, in this occurring in uh, masters athletes taking on a, an Ironman or a seventy point three. They jump on the TT, start doing four or five hour long rides on it, and I, I just see that's sometimes one of the contributing factors. Anything you would you would add to that? It's interesting because we've we've obviously got a couple of athletes who are moving into more long distance, um, and one athlete in particular when they started to transition into the long longer. Um, uh, distance training, um, they they did pick up um, actually more anterior knee pain um, for one. But in terms of 
proximal hamstring tendon pain, yeah, it, it, there is definitely a more compressive component to it. So obviously you're flexing more at the hip to achieve that that that, that position, that aero position. So um, we've used Phil to help us with, because TT bike positioning is really going to be quite important for us at the Olympics as well because of this, the, the sprint. Uh, the, the, the relay, um, sorry, the, the super spring relay. Um, and actually that position is potentially really important. So we've, yeah, we've used Phil and, and Phil Burt's expertise to help us try and achieve that, that, that position correctly and safely. Uh, and I think it's just a matter of those who've never done TT by position, I think you've got to do it in gradual stages because it is quite a big jump. It's, it, you know what I mean, from, a, from your road bike position to that position, if you just jump on it and go and add the volume in very quickly, then you've not probably transitioned and broken in, let's say, the ankles uh, before adding in the, the, the higher volumes. So, yeah, it is going to place more compressive stress and more tensile load potentially at the proximal hamstring. Um, um, so, yeah, something to be very mindful of. And I think Phil will be a really good person to probably talk you through that in a bit more detail from a specific um, by position and how to achieve. Here's, 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 here's your goal, but you're here. How do you get from here to your goal? We don't just go straight into it. You would gradually sort of modify the position and, and, and add a couple of mils each, each, each couple of weeks, each couple of weeks potentially. So yeah, there's, there's that type of um, strategy to use. Um, I think if you are going to go into TT position, then I would say that that adductor becomes even more important because you're placing that hip into further flexion. And like I said, because of the flex position and you're going from flexion to extension, you're going essentially through more range of movement, that adductor becomes really important for that, that, that power production and stability and stabilization of the hip to allow the hamstrings to do what they need to do, which are clearly very important muscles in bike. They produce a hell of a lot of force and power. So yeah, I, I can understand and see the, the correlation with people moving across to a TT bike position and getting aero um, and picking up some of those soft tissue injuries around the, the proximal hamstring for sure. Anything else, uh, Oli, you'd add on the cycling front before we jump over uh, into the running side of things? Um, no, I think I think there's also quite a lot of, and again, I'd probably see this more in the private world, you probably get a few people coming in with sciatic problems um, and, and no, a true belief that there is a, a, a sciatic nerve involvement. And, and to be honest with you, because the hamstring and the, the sciatic nerve are so close, there is, there are, there's every chance that the sciatic nerve may be affected by what's happening at the, at the tendon that it sits very, very close to. Um, so I think just in terms of education around proximal hamstring tendon and tendon um, and mitigation against that will be really useful for, for just recreational um, athletes and um, sometimes of course there is a back issue and that back issue will be causing a sciatic nerve referral of course but the amount of times I've seen people in clinic who've come in with a, with a kind of mindset of I've got a sciatic nerve problem and it's not it's a, it's, it's a tendon problem that's probably just hitting that nerve um, and, and look it's sore, it's, it's, it's a very painful structure highly innovative of course um, um, and no susceptive so you are going to feel it, it's going to be sore um, but yeah the, the not to keep having the same point, but really, really going to town on your hamstring and your adductor strength, conditioning, and function is is probably going to de- remove a lot of that pain. Yeah, no, brilliant and important to if you are suffering from an injury, uh, be clear on the diagnosis and treat it accordingly with different strategies being required. You're listening to Ollie Williamson, senior physiotherapist for British Triathlon and the English Institute of Sport on this part one of all things navigating triathlon and endurance sports injuries. If you missed last week's episode, it was another expert edition featuring none other than Associate Professor Shona Halson, who in 10 days' time will be presenting her three-hour live stream, and it was an exploration of the concept of periodizing an athlete's recovery. In other words, when to include recovery and when not to. Here's a little snippet of my conversation from last week's expert edition with Associate Professor Shona Halson. You know, I think we don't ask athletes enough how they feel and how they respond and what um, what they want to do and why they do some of the things they do because, I mean, not to say that every athlete has every answer, but they've worked out, a lot of them, how to how they do things and why they do things. So I think it's it's just as important to that, yes, we give our expertise, but we listen to, um, to their experience 
experiences as well. To enjoy the full episode, be sure to jump back and whilst there, peruse the archives that in right back to surf life-saving and Ironman champion, Ali Day. But for now, let's jump back with this week's featured guest, Ollie Williamson, Senior Physiotherapist for British Triathlon on this expert edition, Navigating Triathlon and Endurance Sports Injuries. We are jumping over to the run, Ollie. So, uh, gosh, this is where yeah. the rubber hits, or well, the rubber does, or well, I guess the rubber does hit the road with the run. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I often quip that, you know, we're going to see joint stuff, we're going to see bone stuff and tendon stuff. It's it's sort of threefold, but yeah, absolutely. maybe, uh, you know, wherever you want to start here, Ollie. Uh, yeah, well, I think I think we'll go with our, our biggest injury, bur- our biggest time loss in terms of burden on the sport, um, if this injury ever came around, would be a stretch factor, right? So a bone stress injury. Injury that's, that's manifested itself into an interest stress fracture. So time loss there, you're looking between 70 to 80 days. So from a perspective of the sport trying to mitigate that risk happening in the first place, I can go into kind of our strategy if you like um, for it. But for us, trying to trying to reduce that risk is of paramount importance. So it's it's a, it's a season-ending potentially injury. Um, depending on the site in particular, because we do have high-risk sites that are going to have further offload um, from, a, from a non-risky site, let's say. So um, bone stress injuries, of course, are... Um, there's an interesting paper, and I'm pretty sure uh, you saw it, Brad, um, in terms of running and bone adaptation and the preconception of running is, is going to strengthen bones. And I think if you're running far, hard enough, fast enough, and short enough, that's, that's definitely the case. Um, but for, for our cohort and long-distance athletes and endurance athletes, um, running, running is not particularly great for the, for, for, the, for, for, the, for the bones in terms of after about, and there's some evidence now to sort of show that after about 100 contacts, um, this is a study by Robling um, back in 2012, I think, that showed... Um, there was a paper that, um, it was an animal study to be fair, but it showed um, adaptation or, or changes to bone through lots and lots and lots of contacts um, and short, hard, frequent contacts. And those above 100 contacts didn't really show much change in, in bone adaptation and morphology. So in terms of running and endurance running, of course, that's what our guys are doing. So in terms of trying to mitigate any risk against that, we put preventative um, you can't obviously ever put anything in place that's definitely going to prevent an injury, of course. That's, that's not what we're saying. But in terms of filling the gaps or trying to help bone uh, remodel and strengthen bone, we put a lot of emphasis in the gym. So strength and conditioning um, helps to drive a lot of uh, bone turnover. So as long as the strain is high enough, um, and this is this is um, work from from the Liftmore trial. If you look at anything, and that's Belinda Beck's sort of group, who are very I think very close to where you are actually, but on the, on, the, on the Gold Coast there. Um, One of my ex uni lecturers, Ollie. <laughs> all right, yeah, yeah. I tried to catch up with them, we're over, but we never managed to, to meet up actually. Um, anyway, um, they were super fan, aren't they? So the um, so all all that work that's been done. Um, yes, it was done on um, osteoporotic. Uh, patient groups, but it showed that there, there was good maintenance of bone health when a high resistance um, intervention was 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 used versus a control of, of non-high resistance. So that strain is really important. So we put a lot of emphasis in the gym to make sure that our guys are hitting high strain movements, exercises with decent load and weight. To, to stimulate that bone strength and turnover. Um, of course, nutrition comes into this massively. We've already touched upon it from a, from a bone health perspective. Keeping that energy balance is, is key. Um, and then you're looking at all the intrinsic and extrinsic factors and just trying to, to mitigate against that. So vitamin D, obviously, is a big one, part of the nutrition, of course. Uh, big links with that. Um, even this... <sighs> Bone mineral density, of course, is something that we do keep track of. So when an athlete comes onto our program, we, we get an idea of what their baseline is. Uh, and if it's low and low, then we obviously put interventions around it. Uh, and or if an injury has come along, like a bone stress injury or a stress fracture, we've got a baseline to re-measure a DEXA score against 
um, to make sure that we get back up to kind of normal, let's, let's say. So yeah, the, from, just from a physio and SNC perspective, we can, we can touch upon kind of the collaboration of SNC and, and physio in our, in our world, which is really strong, uh, almost the same department, if you like. Um, yeah, a lot of emphasis is placed in that region to, to help mitigate against our bone stress injuries. Um, Training load, of course, is a big key thing. So like I've talked about already, managing that training load, avoiding those spikes, avoiding those uh, great term we used before, boom, burst, and like that. Um, but yeah, these kind of peaks and troughs of, of, of decreasing, increasing training load. Bones don't like that sudden increase. Um, and bones don't like monotony. Bones aren't, aren't a big fan of the monotonous activity. So if you just ran, and you ran long distance, and you did no strength and conditioning, you did no other strain upon the bone from a impact, from a jumping perspective, from a from a variability perspective, from a speed perspective, you wouldn't get much change. And it's like it's, it's like Wolf's law, isn't it? If you put you know from a perspective of um, a bone is an organic structure, so whatever environment that organic structure is placed in, it will adapt to it. So put someone on the moon with no gravity and no force going through the bones, of course, the bones will get weaker. Having Having strain to the bone will, um, in a correct, safe way, of course, um, will help it achieve adaptations and, and, and strength and, and ability to withstand strain. So if we had a, a runner who just kept on running with, with very little, I suppose, consideration of nutrition with strength and conditioning um, and, and the train load in terms of periodization of that and, and recovery, then I'd be seriously worried about that athlete. Um, and just to make sure, you know, of course, there are runners out there who do that, and they obviously have got it right, get the training right, get the nutrition right, and maybe naturally strong, who knows. But, yeah, from our perspective, we want to make sure no stone is left unturned to have this kind of time loss from this particular injury and make sure the full team is integrated around this athlete to make sure that everything extrinsic and intrinsic is as optimal as it can be. Um, we know that... Um, we can touch upon this upon tendon injuries as well, but it's not just about strength, it's how we produce that force. So we call that rate of force development. RFD you may see that terminology used a lot in the literature um, or bounded around sort of Twitter, etc. How, how force is created is really important and how force is absorbed is, is, is important. So we do a lot of drills um, in our in our um in our program and we try and use drills from a variability perspective because it's doing movements that the athletes don't normally do, it's not a straight line, it's not linear um, at times. So we we put an intervention in place to make sure that athletes are adapting and their physical qualities are really being um, uh, improved in that ability to create force and, and absorb. So classic jumping up onto a box would be training someone's ability to create force, turning around and landing back off it would be training an, an, an athlete's ability to absorb force. And there are lots of different ways we can do that. Um, hopping, jumping, drills, great way of, 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 um, of doing that, but also eccentric loading in the gym is another way of, of, of getting that strain into, into, the, into, the, um, into the bone as well as you know, just high force load work. So yeah, lot, lots of things to, to, to do around that. The main, the main thing that we see is around the foot and ankle and the shin in particular, um, and up in, up in the neck of femur, we've had a couple. So there are, there are a couple of areas that probably listeners, it would be good to kind of just touch upon that um, if you, you get pain in these areas, maybe worth just making sure you get those checked. Um, these are called high risk zones, if you like, and that's um, in the foot and ankle, you've got your fifth met, which is the outside um, toe. Uh, the, the base of that fifth mat is, is is something you want to avoid, like the blade, to be honest with you. If you get a stressy in there, it's not ideal. Um, navicular, which is the midfoot um, and the cuboid and the talus, so that's that kind of middle zone of the foot. You want to make sure that if you're getting any pain in that region, get it checked out. The shin is is normally pretty good. Um, it's a long bone, so when you get pain in long bones and, and, and bone, potentially a bone injury needs longer bones. Um, if it's in the middle of the bone, of course, not ideal, but they should recover pretty well. They get good blood supply. And this is why these high risk areas are high risk because the blood supply to them is not great. However, the caveat to that shin injury is anterior cortex. So if you start getting pain on the, on the very sort of sharp border of the front of the, um, of the shin, um, that's something to be really mindful of. Um, neck of femur, a so high up into the hip. Um, so any kind of anterior hip pain that just isn't going, which is there with impact and, um, Night pain is potentially starting to, to come in the in these regions. I'd be I'd be wanting to make sure that um, athletes get checked in. 
So yeah, um, pain that's starting to increase at the start of a session, pain, pain that prolongs, uh, pain is there with impact loading, so hopping, jumping um, is something just to be mindful of. But yeah, please do obviously get a um, professional opinion if anyone is experiencing those. And I think in the high energy expend- expenders, Ollie, such as multi-sport athletes, whether they're recreational, competitive, uh, recreationally competitive or elite, there just has to be a high index of suspicion in these areas of, of a likely bone stress injury. And yeah. Well, yeah. And there's no wriggle room to really get it wrong, is there? <laughs> no, 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 no. And athletes know, you know, athletes know. Coming to see you, I'm sure you have this as well, Brad. Athletes know when they come to see you presenting with this type of thing that they're not hugely surprised when you tell them you've got a high suspicion of, of, of a bone stress. Um, normally they've increased training load. Normally they've, um, you know, started to notice more pain. Um, and it's, it's the first thing you need to rule out in, in, our, in our world in endurance sport. It's the first thing we need to, to rule out 100%. So we always, we always carry that sort of niggling question in the back of our mind. Is this, is this a bone stress injury when someone's presenting with pain in these regions especially? Uh, and there are obviously a few tests you can do clinically to kind of prove that this may be a bone stress. Of course, the only way you are going to get true definitive diagnosis um, is is through an MRI, but that doesn't mean to say everyone's got to get an MRI to, to you know, manage this. Um, the MRI is probably more indicative if it's a high, high risk area, like I said, because that poor blood supply and getting those wrong, you're at risk potentially of um, necrosis, of course, of that tissue if you, if you keep loading it and don't allow it to recover um, and or it may need some, you know, further intervention from, from a specialist. But yeah, the... I suppose the main the main thing there is is um, yeah get, getting that opinion if if you are suspecting um, a bone stress injury of course um, but yeah it's it's but it's it's something that most athletes have experienced um, and once you've experienced one you kind of know what that feeling is I think as well I think a big misconception Ollie is that these injuries take a long time to build up and whilst they may be going through a uh, a change of the bone, underlying bone condition over a continuum or a period of time, the symptoms can come on quite quickly. And I think there's many athletes that do uh, sort of console themselves that it mustn't be bone because it's come on quickly and it hasn't been building up. So is there anything you'd, you'd share around your experiences with that? Yeah, I think the symptom before pain is normally this kind of grumbly stiffness, especially in the foot and the ankle. And I think around that midfoot, we've definitely been caught out once in, in the past Um with a grumbly midfoot that just we let time allowed to kind of be, we allowed the athlete to continue with their training uh, or we didn't advise against it just because we thought it was just a little bit stiff and this person had never had a bone stress injury before. But the, the grumbly midfoot I now get <laughs> alarm out. If I hear that, see that smelling out in a consultation. Um, yeah, you can back it up with other tests to kind of reinforce or rule in, rule out some things, of course. But um, yeah, that grumbly Grumbly midfoot and that sort of anterior hip stiffness mm. is something that I would be yeah, wanting to investigate a little bit further for sure before the pain comes on. Um, but, but like I said, you know, athletes and recreational athletes in particular can should be able to kind of note changes and that's what you're noting. It's a change over time. Pain comes on earlier in a session. Pain takes longer to go. Pain becomes more focal. Um, you know, as well as the kind of contributing factors of your energy balance might be a little bit low. Uh, for female athletes, of course, menstrual cycle is hugely important to, to discuss um, and absence of, of menti- uh, you know, menstrual cycle. Um, so anyone that's you know, had absences for, for 90 days, um, I would obviously be, be um, uh, my alarm bells would be ringing again with kind of uh, with that one. Um, so using, checking with sports doc as well. I mean, of course, it's probably a nutritional reason for that because uh, the energy balance is, is in negative and that's when you get the changes of the pituitary gland and the hormones don't communicate with the right areas of the body to produce uh, a menstrual cycle. So, And that's all down to lack of calories mm. or just the balance, the calories not being sufficient enough to maintain the demands of what's being asked of the body. So that calorific deficit. And um, it's not overnight, of course, it takes a while for that to occur, but yeah, that's something to also be mindful of. And I think we need to, and as clinicians, you know, we really need to be getting used to talking about uh, menstrual cycle with, with female athletes. Uh, obviously, been a taboo subject for, for a long time, but 
highly, highly I talk about Metrocycle a lot with our, with our female athletes, of course, and it's important for us to engage in those conversations about it. So much information to be garnered from those conversations, particularly for the multi-sport athlete. The grumbly stiffness, Ollie, uh, it makes me reflect on, unfortunately, I've experienced a few femoral shaft or thigh bone, bone stress injuries, and every time it started with a stiffness, just my leg just feels stiff. So I think that's a it's a really nice yeah. label in there. Keep an eye out for the grumbly stiffness. I think I think with those one, Brad, in particular, is that medial thigh pain. Mm. Yeah, um, because of that kind of referral through the through the medial aspect through the medial tissues, um, you'll tend to get. And I had one a long, long time ago before I worked in, in triathlon. I had, I had a young female um, uh, track and field runner. Actually, um, wasn't necessarily a long distance runner, but um, yeah, I just had this this kind of medial thigh pain that's just kept going and going and going. And we, we had a look at it because it just wasn't getting better. And that was my first experience of, oh, actually, I probably missed that. Um, and that's that medial thigh referral uh, for anything that's femoral or, or um, yeah. neck of femur, potentially. And neck of femur can obviously present posteriorly as well, but that kind of femoral shaft in particular, medial thigh, is something I'm really hot on. So there you have it, part one of this expert edition with senior physiotherapist for British triathlon, Ollie Williamson, navigating triathlon and endurance sports injuries. Now, I'm sure you took some great learnings away from part one of Ollie's sharings. Whether you are an athlete of any level, practitioner or coach, I hope and I know there were some great learnings that you took away. Now, as you wait for part two coming up next week, reach out to Ollie on social media. Jump over and give Ollie a follow on Twitter at Ollie W, O-L-I-W underscore physio and let Ollie know one of the top learnings that you took away from his sharings. Now, part two of this conversation is not to be missed. Ollie shares in detail around navigating common lower limb running related tendon conditions. Achilles tendinopathy, plantar fasciitis, along with one of the most common running related ailments, the dreaded recurring calf strain. In addition, Ollie shares some fantastic practical tips for practitioners, athletes, and coaches alike around return to run programs following injury, along with common mistakes that practitioners may make in dealing with endurance athletes, and also the common mistakes that athletes themselves will make in dealing with their own endurance based injuries. And of course, There's the top tip, which incidentally involves recovery and a fantastic physical challenge that will test you to the max, or at least test your calves to the max. So be sure to be tuning in next week for part two of the conversation. In the meantime, a massive thanks to those leaving ratings and reviews for the show over on iTunes. Also for hitting subscribe to ensure each and every episode lands in your earbuds each and every Thursday. Be sure to secure your ticket for the upcoming Dr. Shona Halson live stream the 24th of October, Recovery Essentials for Optimal Performance. Tickets are available for just $49 with a post-event recording available to you. Remember, as Shona says, the only training we are benefiting from is the training that we are recovering from. So we need to learn the practical hows, scientific whys, and also you'll enjoy some scientific myth busting as part of the live stream. A massive thanks to the great folk who make this show possible each and every week. Daryl Misson, our audio engineer. Susan Wilkin on all things show administration. Matthew Walden on all things show graphic design. And Lily Burden assisting behind the scenes with all things social media. Now, following part two next week of this expert edition featuring Ollie Williamson, you heard Ollie reference a gentleman by the name of Phil, Phil Burt. And Ollie has graciously introduced myself and therefore the Physical Performance Show listenership to Phil Burt's expertise. Phil will be appearing on an upcoming expert edition around all things cycling bike fits and cycling injuries. A little snippet on Phil's bio, Phil is a world-renowned cycling health and performance innovator, having consulted to the world-conquering Team Sky cycling team for many years and also spending 12 years as a physiotherapist at British Cycling. Phil's authored several books, including Bike Fit, so I know you'll enjoy Phil Burt coming up as a future guest of the Physic Performance Show. Until next week, part two with Ollie Williamson navigating triathlon and endurance sports injuries. Be sure to keep pursuing your physical best performance. I'm Brad Beer, and this has been the Physic Performance Show.